And then this is where I would not have believed how effective social media was. Within 18 months, I'd gone from 80% secondary to 80% primary. Wow. And that ability to be able to select and filter, um, you know, uh, uh, and I, it's a, it's a bit like an interview. I said, every time they try and engage with us, it's another chance for like an interview to plow yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We are in season four already. It's amazing because I get to interview a couple of guys who have already interviewed years before. And our whole theme for this season is to find that gold nugget. And it's a real honor and privilege for me to have a guy who's been in the game for decades and has had such an influence in Rhinoplasty, Mr. Charles East from London. Charles, thanks for being here on the show today. Oh, pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's always good to talk. That's great. Eh? In a candid way or in a relaxed way yeah, outside no, and, of a meeting. And uh, we had some really interesting things we were talking about off air of what should we be discussing. And I think I want to climb straight into it, it's this privacy thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we've got various challenges in um, how we as rhinoplasty surgeons can, number one, demonstrate our work legally. Mm -hmm and with permission because i think uh, one of the big factors now and something that i think a lot of uh surgeons have been aware of and the most aware is my wife yeah 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 of this and for the listeners that that is charles's wing lady who also works at the Rhine london rhinoplasty yeah she's lydia she's lydia badia yeah who's um very forward thinking and very very sharp and um, from a personal experience of uh, being exposed and not able to defend ourselves, it sort of was a real wake-up call. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of people have been concerned about this because pirating of images, control of your image, once it's left you, you've lost it. And if it appears somewhere and a patient recognizes it and knows you took it, you end up the subject of a potentially a, a claim. Yeah. So this has big implications because we we take pictures of the face. Yes. So confidentiality and privacy are going to be the area where people will be vulnerable in the future. Yeah. And it's going to have a big impact in what we can talk about, what we can show. Because wherever you go now, I don't know if you, you go onto any internet picture. Yeah. There's a privacy statement everywhere. Yeah. And I bet most of us in the business don't have that. No, absolutely we don't. Tell me. But so I, I, I have a concern about because, I, you know, from that sort of personal point of view about uh, publishing something, which was like sort of five years ago, um, got into a sort of awkward situation where uh, a former patient went back through and identified that image, which you could, no one else could recognize, but there was enough weight in that that it gave us a, a real jolt. Really? Because, yeah, we became, we were pursued. Uh, for privacy, not because the operation was substandard. It's on the privacy front to really use. So I think that's a massive challenge for us. And I'm not quite sure how we're going to sort of address that um, across the board because it has implications, as I say, for what you can stand up, what you can talk, what you can show. Um, so we've got some sort of, I suppose, we, we're working through that. We haven't actually got a solution for it yet, but I think everyone's got to look at this and think, mm. okay, because if you're showing pictures of someone who you took four years ago or so, the consent then is very different to what the consent is now. You can see it. Yeah. And um, so I see that as a challenging area. And I think as a more senior guy, and thank you very much for referring to the fact I've been here for decades. I, I no, do. That's in a good way, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, you don't re I'm trying to remember this, but that when you were still, I think, early, early, you, get, you were involved in publishing that book about basic ENT and as a medical student yeah. I remember studying that I mean that must be studied all around the whole world you never thought that was a very popular book I have to say it we've got translation into five different languages it's amazing and was reprinted about three or four times yeah. so that was yeah that was on the wing and a prayer with Ram Dillon from <laughs> when I was a senior registrar yeah so I was one of those yeah. lucky yeah. hits it was We're a kind of sidetrack there yeah so two years ago when we spoke you guys were developing a technology I think if I remember for your eyes only. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, so um, that is uh, an innovative program for um, 
constant facial recognition. Yes. Um, and most of us have got phones, smartphones now have a facial recognition picture, but once you've gone through that and the recognition is switched off. Yes. The, the UO um, was developed by a friend of mine, actually just serendipitously when we were together at a party in Greece somewhere, started talking about this. I thought, mm, this is interesting. They got slowed up terribly because of COVID and a little lack of, of, of capitalization. But this program potentially will be a game changer for us because you will only be able to see the image when your face is directly at the camera. Yes. If you turn sideways, the screen goes blank. If someone looks over your shoulder, the screen goes blank. If you turn or if you uh, try and screenshot it, it, you're not allowed to. It won't allow you to take a screenshot. So you have you have complete control over your images. As I'm hopeful, I mean, next year I uh, ascend to the presidency of the Rhinoplasty Society of Europe. And it's one of the things I want to sort of roll out um, so that we hopefully can have an absolutely secure platform. That only the person who's intended to see that can look at it, can see the webinar, can see the, 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 the course perhaps that's being um, put on. So they, if they have you at the front end and we know they've paid, then you've got this absolute certainty that the images and the data that you're, is, is still under your control. So what is the time lag? Say I'm, I'm listening to an RSE webinar or something and I'm, I don't know, my kid is... About, it's about 15 or 20 milliseconds. Oh, oh so it's instant. Yeah, pretty oh. much instant, yeah. Okay. Um, and so, I mean, obviously it means you're going to have to concentrate, look at the screen all the time, because if you look away, it goes blank. But, I mean, the principle of that front end, um, I think, is going to have a lot of promise for us, because then you know that your image cannot go anywhere else other than that intended group. And the beauty about that product is it can be geotagged, so it can be located to a country, wow. uh, a map region. You know, the, you know the thing with three the three words that maps every square meter of the yes. earth. No, what? So, so you can you can geotag it to be it. in that square. Yes. You can you can um, tag it to a an agreed group of surgeons. So oh. that is stuff for the board. So it has great flexibility, and you can give permissions. You can give permissions for sharing that image. Yeah, yeah. So not only images but documents and things. Yes. So I think I think I think that's one of our, from my point of view, one of the things I want to really try and push at the next stage is that ability to be able to work confidentiality, know your images are not going to be disseminated. Now, of course, you can't stop someone taking a picture yes. in in a lecture, um, but um, it, this is just the kind of start of it. And, and I, I mean, I from my experience, I would say, look, everyone's really got to look at this privacy issue Very seriously. Um, Tell me, we had an amazing meeting with uh, in Berlin, the IMR his meeting, changing track now with the REC. When are you taking over from Werner as the new president? Uh, it'll be next summer at the um, uh, this coming summer in Riga. So I guess June twenty twenty four. And and then that is a three year two two year position. And, and so I'm, I'm so, I mean, I'm a member of RSC. I love it. The, the guys are like these rhinoplasty geeks. It's all they, they bother about with rhinoplasty. Is, what, have you got a few ideas of how you want to bring new things in or do anything differently? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a relatively young society. Um, the positive things that it's done in there is it's got a growing membership. So yeah. we need to expand the membership. Number two, um, I think like, several societies it's had a very popular webinar series yes. that will continue uh, number three it's got a fellowship program that's actually functioning pretty well so i'm in one facet of that and i'd like to expand that further um and then four for my sort of rubber stamp on that would be the sort of trying to introduce sort of confidentiality yeah, the confidentiality yeah so that there's some so people that you know you can uh, the the information that can be shared or disseminated with members of the RSC will be secure. So this is a question which is, might be difficult to answer, is how do you get the balance right between having somebody in a society who dabbles in rhinoplasty, whereas someone who's committed to wanting to make it happen? Because the worst is a little bit of knowledge. Yeah. Teach someone a little bit, he might or she might do 
two, maybe three rhinoplasties a year, and then things just go south. Yeah. But how do you get that kind of balance to? Well, you can't really impose that. I mean, I, 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 the one that is, it, it's a it's a problem, and I think certainly in the UK if, um, now, plastic surgery, aesthetic surgery, is badged by regions. And I think that's probably going to be something that will disseminate. Badged out. by region. Yeah. In so you can't you can't be a breast surgeon. You have you can have to be badged for body, oh, or face. Okay, okay. And so the restrictions on your training, um, and the problem this obviously is that yes, okay, you can show the badge, but you can still go out and put your plaque up on the wall or go to another country and say you do this yeah. and the other. You're never going to stop that. But I mean, I think you know, the power of social media and the sort of rapid way in which sort of bad news gets out is probably going to self-select a lot of those people out. Yeah. Um, you're not going to stop them, but also through education, and when I say this to most of the fellows that come through, I said, you've got to make your mind up whether you're going to do this operation yeah. or not, because there's no place for the sort of part-time ride. Right. And, and a lot of guys sort of coming through... Um, haven't seen a lot in their training and they come and they've been taught stuff that's kind of like 15 20 years ago by the their current teachers yeah and they come and sort of see stuff and they it's it's, it's like a, it's like a different world absolutely so i said look you know this is going to take you some time to get used to so you've got to really be wanting to do this surgery so you can be a breast surgeon and a rhinoplasty surgeon you can do you know facelifts and yeah and that's that, that, such like but I think at the end of the day, we're going to end up being much more sort of streamlined. So the generalist, I think, certainly in the UK, is going to be much less common. And um, tell me, coming back to the, the fellows and visitorships and stuff, how, how does that work? I mean, London's a hub, so there are people around the world. It's quite easy in a way to come. In terms of coming to visit you, you're quite strict on, on how many people come at a time and, yeah. and that kind of thing? So, I mean, yes. Um, Unless until you sort of have people visiting you, you don't realise quite how difficult it is sometimes. Your energy suck to, oh. to 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 be focusing on what's going on in the operating theatre, to think of the case, to avoid the mistakes, and to have someone talking. So I'm fairly strict. Um, we have a fellow which who who is, attends once a week, and we have visiting fellows from the Rhinoplasty Society of Europe. So they're limited. So they're only with me part time. I went for the London branch of the RSC. I recruited four surgeons because London's big enough. And I said, look, one person, it's really hard to shepherd it's someone and look after right? them. And it's very, so you need to have three or four people. I said, okay, you're with me on a Monday. You go and see him on Tuesday, her on Thursday. Um, so it's disseminated. And then that gives everyone a little bit of air and space. Secondly, in the operating theatre, you've got to set your, your rules, your boundaries. And mine are, okay, you don't ask me questions. If I'm talking, good for you, but we'll discuss the case afterwards. Please watch. And you've seen it. You know, there's a video camera, so you can see everything that's going on. And that way, you can still have the focus on making sure you're doing well, doing the operation well, because believe you and me, I still, you know, developing preservation rhinoplasty. I've made all the mistakes with this. So you, you, you need, need to, you, I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, I've been in the, in the theater with you and seen the results and I think it was like, this guy knows what he's doing. Eh? So I'm glad you say you've made the mistakes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you should ask my wife that. There's, a, there's often, yeah, there's a few, often a few sort of expletives that come out when yeah. I drop the radix by mistake. And yeah. anyway, he, he, learning to rescue it. I mean, it, yeah. Yeah. If you're a good surgeon, you can normally rescue it, but things happen yeah. and the point about that is if you've got a lot of people asking you questions leaning over it's actually quite distracting it is. Sure. Um, so I, I think you have to make your mind up again whether you want people in your theatre yeah. or whether you want to uh, limit it to video clips and just yeah. just talking but as you know the, the experience of when you're in theatre is second to none I mean there's so oh. many other no. nuances you pick up I, I, I feel like I'm a sponge when I'm in theatre with, with the, the top guys I just like look and, I'm, and there's so much to learn eh? oh. and, and tell me um, how is the things going in the practice itself uh, practice is well, we're fortunate we're oversubscribed um, I've made active decisions about how I wanted to change my practice and um, yes, I mean, one of my bugbears was the more senior you get, the more complicated patients you get sent. Mm. And I didn't want to end up my last part of my sort of career 
just doing complex surgery. Yes, yes. You're carrying the baggage, the psychology, you know, they're hard. And so about three years ago, um, we basically had a complete review of the journey of, and we set the standards. We want 70% primary patients and 30% secondary. And then what you do is set where your target area is, the group of patients you want to target. And then this is where I would not have believed how effective social media was. Within 18 months, I'd gone from 80% secondary to 80% primary. Wow. And that ability to be able to select and filter, um, you know, uh, uh, and I, it's, it's a bit like an interview. I said, every time they try and engage with us, it's another chance for like an interview to plow yourself. So you end up, fortunately, and you can only do it when, you, when you're, you're oversubscribed, but you're really filtering down to get nice people all the time. Because it only takes nice noses, but nice people. Well, I, you know, the thing is that, and you, you're a sucker for, you know, thinking, yes, I could do that nose. And, and you, you see the nose, but not what's behind it. Yeah. I've made that mistake so many times, and then I regret it. And then it's not only that, it's all your office manager's time with all the emails, phone calls going back and forth. When you cost it out, that ends almost as that you've earned nothing from that. Yeah. And there's a lot of negative energy gone out too. So... Um, it, I'm very grateful to Lydia, certainly, who's really drummed that home to me, that uh, it's important that we get positive patients. Mm. And if you get that gut, and it's funny, you know, I, I disregarded that sort of feeling in the past, thinking, yeah, I can fix this. But it's maybe the feminine side of things, you know, us guys who just like, we're steam ahead and do stuff. Yeah, I mean, ladies are more... The ego, the ego is terrible yeah. for us. <laughs> I mean, it is absolutely, it's our worst enemy. Yeah. So, but I think once you realise it... And you don't need to be like that. It makes a difference. Exactly. So, so you, what you're doing is just based creating a nice environment. And people like Roland Daniel, who masters of that, yeah. masters of picking the patient. You know, first awkward question, the, the fee goes up $500. Second awkward question, the fee goes up 1000 Third question, he says, there's a jack in the box under every patient. The third awkward question, boing, jack's out of the box. The patient's never operated on, and Jack never goes back in. Okay, so so what are the kind of awkward questions? Oh, you must know those. You know, I, I think of it sometimes. The patient who has about 500 photographs. Well, that's one. There are many different sort of facets, but I think if you look at it in general terms, it, it's when you're talking to someone, if you, you get a feeling yeah, yeah, quickly, yeah, yeah, it would yeah, be yeah, likely. Quickly. And then in the discussion, there's like a circle or a loop and you talk around, you know, this is what happened, these are the risks, this is what we do, this is the process, this is the price. And you, you hope to close the loop yes. for that person to have surgery. Well, I, those patients are one where it's a spiral, like a oh, spring. Yeah, you yeah, never yeah, close yeah. the loop. So it keeps on going round and round. And each of those turns sucks more energy out of you, your staff. And you just need to make sure that, okay, I'm not going to go into the spiral. The loop's never going to close with you. I'm not the person for you. I don't think I can satisfy your needs. Um, sorry, Keith. And, and I think once you learn to say no, and that took me a long time too, you happy life. You never regret turning a patient down. So lots of different things. I mean, these are sort of, I think, things you sort of acquire with age and a bit of maturity and experience. So, um, yeah, so from that, so hopefully, oh, I'll still make mistakes, I'm sure, but now I think you know we cruise along in a much better way, and the practice is defined in which we have systems in place mm -hmm. so that so everyone knows what the protocol is for here. Yeah. And the more you do that, the easier it is for anyone who's say on holiday or you have a locum just steps in. They just follow the process. Absolutely. Um, and I think that takes a lot of effort and yeah. time to do, but it's worth it in the long term. Yeah. Charles, I love chatting to you. I to, I've always, when I'm at a meeting, I've got to have a few minutes with, with you because it's, it's really, I mean, I appreciate it. It's, you, 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 if, if someone takes the time to listen to what you say, there's a lot of wisdom in, in what you do. And, and, and I think yeah. this is a kind of episode you need to listen to twice because you might miss a few things in between. Eh? Yeah. You know, so thank you. Eh? No, it's interesting. I've had people coming up to me and saying, I do enjoy the things you've said about process rather than necessarily how to put the stitch in. Yeah. No. Anyway, thank you for asking me. Listen, and I really hope that that, that your presidency will be super like uh, fruitful for the society. Yeah, I hope so too. 
I think there's a big opportunity here, particularly with sort of bringing societies with a little bit more integration too. Fantastic. Guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Go and mull over it again and uh, improve to be a better surgeon in everything you do. Charles, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, Cameron. Pleasure. Cool, guys. Bye-bye. Goodbye. For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests.